Packet Pushers. Hello and welcome to Packet Protector, the podcast at the intersection of networking and security. I'm Jennifer J.J. Manella here with Drew Conry Murray. Today, we're talking with Juniper Networks in a sponsored episode about how to streamline the operational complexity that affects network and cybersecurity teams alike, something we are all struggling with on a daily basis. We also discuss the new security capabilities in the Juniper portfolio, the universal ZTNA approach that provides a single policy per user for networking and security, and how Juniper's MIST AI is going to support network and security operations. Our guest is Mike Spanbauer, the field CTO of security at Juniper Networks. Well, Mike, welcome to the podcast. And just to kick things off, one of the issues that we're all struggling with when we're talking about networking and security teams is data and specifically the types of data talking about logs and alerting, because contrary to the packet pushers motto that too much technology and networking is still never enough, I think there is such a thing as too much (laughs) of a good thing when it comes to all of that information. So how do you see that affecting operations and what's your strategy around resolving that? I think, you know, at the root of that is we are seeing more, you know, network and security telemetry information, more data today in operational teams than we've ever seen, right? You know, in 20, 25 years of growth in this space. And to your point, right, you know, while we do need to ensure we have all of the data to ensure we're making, you know, the right decisions that the right technology can analyze, of course, those data sets and so forth, the volume has created its own unique issue. And we have this, you know, data glut challenge. So this is, I think, actually probably the most important area that the concepts of AI can look to address because, you know, when you have uh, effective models learning on, you know, vast data sets, but then, you know, rationalizing what to present, not that any of the data is lost, only that what's shared with the operational users, right, you know, either in times of incident investigation or in just assessing the health of the environment, you know, whether it be the security side or the networking side of the desk. The fact is that being able to leverage, you know, the proposal, right, this outcome of artificial intelligence in that sense uh, really, you know, I think, can kind of reduce the noise, not again eliminate it, but take in and just all of it and come up with high quality outcomes and, and really help the operations, men and women, there at the keyboards trying to you know, do their jobs day in and day out. (laughs) You said the center bingo card word of AI, and I think we're going to want to come to that a little later. But I think one of the big things too, that I know we discuss a lot on the security side and infrastructure side is do we even have the right data? Because we tend to like enable logging and alerting and telemetry and metrics for everything. And we send them off five different places and we really don't know which, you know, Maybe the SIM tool has access to everything, but there's probably three other syslog servers somewhere that have the rest of the context. So we don't always even have the right data, even when we have all of the crap enabled to go all of the places. And so I think that kind of speaks to some of the complexity you touched on. And, you know, from the tooling perspective of how do we feed things into and then, you know, get them back out of and view it. How do you see tool sprawl is feeding into this with the complexity? It's a conversation that I have with customers and with partners often, which is there's both the tooling access to the data issues that many organizations have, right? Whether we're talking about the 30 to 70 security solutions that the average organization has or the data sources and where those are ingested. Because we've got the syslog servers, but when we talk to SIM, for example, I can't even think of an organization that I've spoken to in like the last three to five years that isn't triaging the telemetry information to reduce it to a more manageable bite coming off of the appliance or off of the solution, off of the technology itself, either because of specific log costs from that space of the environment, but also the whole prospect of the perpetual licensing there, but also just making sure that the logic or the analysis that goes into this is set up to look at the right sequences. Because as you probably know, in the world of SIM intelligence, right, you know, building effective inquiries and so forth demands incredible talent in the chairs. In a lot of cases, there are solutions that are much easier to manage and so forth out there, but without getting into any one of them, any output from a SIM is really predicated on ensuring that the right inquiries are going into the SIM. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole strata of companies. I know, Drew, when we walked through the RSA floor, I mean, it felt like there were two whole rows of just companies. Gartner didn't see this one coming, did they? Of how do we, you know, scope down the logging before you send it into hashtag super expensive log aggregation slash SIM tool to pare that down? Because, yeah, they got to the point where I think everybody was looking at, okay, well, any part of the infrastructure, whether it's networking or security, you know, there's this much for the license, there's this much for the management. And then they started adding these line items. Oh, and your department needs to 
budget for the log management because that's such a significant part of the solution now. And it also contributes to the talent challenges back to the point I made, right? Those consultants on the front end of those high end SIM solutions. Well, perhaps my career choice could have been more lucrative had I picked that path myself. But uh, yeah, the fact is that it does require a very talented consultant or configuration expert. And most organizations don't necessarily retain full-time tuner for a couple of those platforms in particular that are incredibly popular simply because of the cost, right? So I do think that that's a challenge, which gets back to your original question of the data going in and making sure that all of it's presented in the right way, which then can be surfaced and shared with the operators. And, and I think all of it sort of highlights why we have the challenges we do in regards to time to detect, time to identify, and then ultimately, of course, time to either mitigate or remediate in the world of security, which every organization faces challenges with day in and day out. So I think network and security teams probably know they have a data issue and maybe a tool sprawl issue. Do you get a sense that executives or senior leadership are aware that there are problems in these spaces? The conversations that I've had with the C-suite around these challenges, you know, it isn't about one specific tool or one console, but rather that they hear is that oftentimes the time to address an incident, you know, due to either visibility to a tool or, or we're not even recognizing that it was actually partially another team's data, it really exacerbates or contributes to this challenge. And so, you know, you've got the dedicated networking folks, which are looking at a specific set of criteria and matrices. You've got the security side of the equation who's looking at incidents, uh, events, threat intelligence, and other aggregations, but they're not always chatting with each other. I've been, of course, always, you know, working sort of with each other budgetarily and, and so forth. And, and it's not a universal rule, but a lot of organizations still have these separations. We won't call them silos, but I think they come together a little more than they used to be, but they're still kind of functioning reasonably autonomously. And I think that's part of the issue too. So the execs see this and also more importantly, see that they have unfilled wrecks. Right? You know, like you hear they need staff for these things and those things, which further takes away from, again, the speed or this agility that they ultimately need for their business outcomes and just doing these faster, better and more securely. This strikes a chord with me deep in the cockles of my heart because I just taught a workshop a few days ago on security principles for technology leaders. And part of what we were talking through is where is our opportunity to break down, you know, I hate to say break down the silo. Sorry, guys, there's your other bingo square. <laughs> but there's some truth to it, right? And so we had in one part of the class, like a Venn diagram of traditional IT operations and then traditional security functions and operations. And I just had people spout out like some function and then tell me IT is it security or is it both or either. And the takeaway from that activity with 30 some people in this class we were doing was almost everything. And I think like the couple of corner cases was like help desk and certain compliance functions. Everything else was either both or it could be an either. And so the fact that we even have, you know, separate teams, separate tooling, separate data repositories for all of this, because operationally and then for troubleshooting and like you mentioned, incident response and then recovery it just does not make sense to keep passing the balls back and forth between teams with different tools. It's just mind boggling that we're still here. Yeah. And I think that gets back to the volume of data that we have. I think at the root of at least part of this is fundamentally, we have more data than we've ever had in human history, right? Just stepping back even from technology, right? More broadly, there's more available to everyone than there ever has been. And in the world specific to the operations teams and business and so forth, managing, keeping things secure as well as the networks up and healthy, surfing through this is more difficult, more challenging than anyone would have guessed we'd be here, you know, in 2024, right? If history is any indicator of the future, then it's not going to get better unless we look at a different way of solving the problem. That's just where we're at. And I think, you know, this is where we're spending a lot of time thinking about how to be innovative and address this with both the technology and tooling we have, but more importantly, recognizing what customers ultimately need to change that dynamic, to change the outcome, to provide a more secure environment, a more secure network. Yeah. And I think what they need is not to have to hire a bunch of people and then train every person for literally weeks at a time for every freaking platform and piece of infrastructure that we need to manage. I wholeheartedly agree, JJ. That is one of my passion things. And, you know, I can get on a soapbox and we can go for another hour on that point. But I agree. You don't hire for the problems to fix it via human capital because, candidly, there's inherent risk in that. And so we have a million and five open recs in security today globally, it ain't going to go down unless we think about this problem in a little different way. I know Drew wants to talk about AI. I'm going to say it one more time because I have to pay a listener every time I say those letters. So Drew, you have to ask the probing questions. You're not allowed to say AI anymore. I'm not allowed to. It's very expensive at a dollar each. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> wow. 
Well, so yeah, let's get into that then, because I think most listeners probably recognize Juniper as a player in the networking space, certainly routing and Wi-Fi and so on. What does Juniper bring to the table in terms of security that folks might not be familiar with? You know, Juniper has been in the security arena, in network security particularly, for uh, over 20 years, right? Starting back in the NetScreen days, right? So we still have the incredible brand as the SRX product land, but also there's a host of additional supporting capabilities that enable customers to be able to effectively identify and block threats, you know, via the environment itself. And so, you know, firewalls, virtual containerized, physical, of course, and also a host of other services that support that, which is furthermore leveraging our incredible networking heritage too, right? We know a few things about routing and switching and wireless. And of course, the firewalls themselves, you know, the code upon which they run, leverage that. So, you know, in terms of network security, you know, firewalls, an inline device that has to behave and perform incredibly well and do the job of seeing and blocking the bad things also exceptionally well, mm-hmm. which is in third-party testing, we've shown that we get incredibly high marks, best in industry now for many years. And so I won't go into all the details as to how we achieve those scores, but uh, you know, it takes hard work, dedication, a really incredible threat intelligence team, but also a fantastic set of logic processes and appliances and the services themselves to do that. And we, we demonstrate that for our customers day in and day out as we protect them. And Juniper acquired a company called Mist several years ago that brought AI into the Wi-Fi space. Are you broadening that out to encompass networking and security? Yeah. So the Mist offering specifically, and the company, of course, has gone on to become the basis for our enterprise campus and branch capabilities. And one of the things that we're, in fact, doing uh, and have been hearing for quite some time is to encourage, and more importantly, enrich the availability of both security insights or information within MIST, but further extend the operational capabilities that our customers can take advantage of through that portal. So, and to that point, right, in June, we, in fact, announced one of the new solutions, which was the security insights capability. It's an extension of the premium analytics product within MIST that offers both networking and security teams the ability to take a look at all this telemetry we just shared. And we've admitted it's challenging for most teams because that portal allows for a very simple reporting structure and view into all that data, which is ingested into the cloud-based data lake, right, that ultimately then our AI within MIST runs on. So I don't have to pay a dollar for each one, I hope, JJ, but so. <laughs> you get a free pass, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you probably get paid to say it. I, I'm the opposite. <laughs> I remember the first time I saw MIST was at a tech field day, one of the field day events years ago, I guess before probably Juniper had acquired that technology. And Drew and I are going to be at a security field day in a couple of weeks together. That'll be fun. Mm-hmm. But I remember at the time, and I wrote a blog post, whenever that was, basically, this is not a wireless company. This is actually a data analytics company. And they were already at the time, like the whole organization was built around data scientists, not networking professionals. And the purpose of the wireless APs was purely that they felt they had to design the hardware with the capabilities to get the data that they needed to do the analysis on it. So it was a, I'm going to call it machine learning, a machine learning company with a lot of data science that happened to be making hardware to feed that engine. And I think that was a shift for a lot of us in approaching it because it was fundamentally different. And there were definitely, I mean, full disclosure of work with everybody's, you know, wireless products over the years, but there was certainly a, a difference. You know, I teach labs with some of the products and using that and using the MIST product in those lab environments, it's easy to see the troubleshooting and the data that's bubbling up to the top. And it does look fundamentally different. So, you know, I'm kind of curious. I know one of the events Juniper had the actual data scientists presenting. And now that's all above my head. Like one day I hope to be smart enough to read a day data science for dummies book. I'm not there yet. There is something different that you guys do with the machine learning and the AI. There we go. I'm up to like $5 now. Could you talk us through that? Like just maybe a couple sentences about why it's different or how it's different? Sure. No, I'd be happy to. And I think you touched on something particularly important that I want to you know, make sure we emphasize, which is that you know, MIST indeed saw themselves and really innovated around this concept of the data being the most important piece, right? You know, yes, the connectivity components, right? The access points and so forth are critical. They're important, right? It's what, of course, the devices connect to. But, but radios and so forth are reasonably well understood. And the challenge that was being recognized that the industry hadn't tackled and really you know, taken on head on was that with all of the information available, right, getting to root cause more quickly and ultimately, you know, what they've also further innovated on, you know, in MIST via the AI engine, right, Marvis, is that it can autonomously correct to control network health or environmental anomalies before users ever feel or see them, right? So when your network can self-heal truly, 
and you know be able to you know eliminate something before a help desk ticket ever occurs it's magic and and that's actually the exact feedback we've had from very very large organizations that have struggled with managing their infrastructure and you know being flooded with help desk tickets day in and day out what mist has done is changed the economics changed the operational experience and ultimately delivered on that to the wireless and the wired space and and of course to that point and if i may marching down that path right we've now taken that capability that incredible data and science and insights on the infrastructure in the land space, extended it out to you know SD WAN a year and a half ago, right? We'd acquired a company called 120T, further integrated that in. Now, you know, it's part of the basis for this WAN edge capability, adding to it now in July with the AI data center, uh, as well as the routing capabilities. And what we're you know excited to share today is that of course we're bringing a robust security capability also under the MIST umbrella for customers to take advantage of and to ultimately both configure, monitor, and to secure their organization, right? Their business. And looping back on that a little bit, I know with some of the networking stuff you guys have been doing, especially the Wi-Fi on the AI front, you mentioned the support actually uses that information. So supposedly when you call support or TAC or whatever, put something, you know, in the portal, the first thing that they have to do is figure out, could that engine have solved the problem and should it have? And then they train it if it didn't, but most of the time it did. Now you just kind of listed off a long list of new things, you know, being announced today and new security capabilities. Is that the same path they're going to go with the security portfolio that we're going to have a similarly trained engine behind it? Indeed. And indeed, the vision is that we apply the same kind of, we'll call guided learning model, because I think, you know, most organizations are reticent to commit to full autonomous learning because there's just concerns about AI poisoning. I mean, there's a whole host of things that threat actors are doing out there, which I know this isn't the episode for it, but there is real risks to allowing your AI to just run. So this guided model of basically, you know, monitoring and stewarding the data ingestion mechanics and making sure that either the logic and the proposed operational outcome is correct, right, just validating the decision was right, or where there is something that perhaps didn't make the leap in logic, then investigation occurs to determine exactly how we can close that. And that's you know much the same process that has been employed and very successfully observed for wireless, for wired, for all of the preceding capabilities. And we're excited to now you know, get on this path for security offering as well. You mentioned Security Insights was a new capability you announced in June. Can you talk a little bit more about what that is? Are you talking about getting telemetry, so logs, alerts, and so on from SRXs and putting it in the data? data lake and doing analysis or what is security insights and what do I get from it as an end user? Indeed, security insights was added and made available to customers in the June timeframe. And in particular, right, it is the capability to both ingest from uh, SRXs and, you know, other security elements in the environment, pulling that up into the data lake and then also reporting on it from something as simple as security actions taken, where it's, of course, aggregating blocks. And then you could query, of course, via a whole host of variables, but IP-based blocks, user-based navigation URLs or other potential threats, right? There's a whole host of capabilities. And it isn't intended to replace a SIM, but instead, again, provide insights into that real-time data set so that it may, you know, help in the time of troubleshooting or you know, investigation on either the network or the security side, what's going on, right? Because finding the information quickly, because, you know, time is the most valuable currency in the world of security, finding things fast and, and doing so without having to open up four consoles and try to correlate the IP addresses copied out or exported into some alternate data set, right? <laughs> These are the challenges that organizations face and ultimately we're looking to solve for is, again, providing this insights portal to both networking and security teams because it's our fundamental belief that bringing them closer together and giving that data to both solves for challenges. That's what I wanted to ask about is like when you guys are visioning this, did you see this as arming the networking team with security information, with the security team with networking information? I mean, you're a field CTO for security. When you talk to people, what are you hearing in the field that they're struggling with that kind of drove some of how you built this? So there's a few things that I hear often, right? There's the talent retention challenges, right? So you've got your expert operators out in customer environments, some of whom have been there for quite some time. And, and there's a concern of loss of talent, right? If they're finding, you know, that somebody comes in with a sniper offer, it's just hard to match, right? You've got some volatility. You don't want to depend on you know, losing an expert resource to an outside offer and leaving you in a crippled state. So you know, having some resilience in visibility and in the team itself ensures that, you know, organizations are more able to manage the people side of this equation. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the operational response times. And that's just the fact we hear that, you know, oftentimes it takes minutes to figure out which consoles I need to pull up. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, right, find the right fields, 
you know, clicking in through the event strings or even finding that in some cases, as we mentioned before, there's often information triage, right? They trim back what's ingested. And so not having all of it in the single console makes things even more complicated. So now I have to go in another system, log into the syslog, pull that portion of the record. And we're talking, you know, the clock's ticking, right? So if it's an ongoing issue, these are challenges. So, you know, speed is often kind of executive level discussion to more quickly and effectively protect their business or either you know manage or recover from something that may be off and having the broadest possible team able to support it, as well as not having the finger pointing between silos. Sorry, I've, I think I've filled an entire bingo card twice now. I'm not trying to, but <laughs> you know, had I had the bingo card in front of me, I probably would have been better at avoiding it. But I'm guessing there's a resilience. You know, I mean, Drew and I did a, an episode not too long ago on resilience. You know, we always talk about the security piece of it from the pure like risk management standpoint. But the truth is, is that for a lot of organizations, the availability function of we need to make sure things are passing packets and running as they should, ideally in a secured way. But if nothing else, sometimes it's availability trumps security. It sounds like this could tackle, you know, I'm trying to not say kill two birds with one stone because that sounds mean, but I do keep saying it. Yeah, well, as a friend of mine, of course, in the security space with quite a reputation, right? So Kate Adam used to say, feed two dogs with one bowl. Oh, so. <laughs> I love Kate. I've taken to feed two birds with one scone, but it's a hard habit to break. So I'm curious about some of the other security things you guys are doing. So certainly, I mean, we've got the addition or inclusion of the security capabilities. Specifically, it's going to be referred to or orderable as security assurance. And what that actually means for customers is that there will be, you know, SRX and SSR security services configuration available via API within MIST. And, and we're not trying to overcomplicate or to expose all the internals that, you know, for those who have ever gone into signature regex tuning and or the deep annals of security ops and maintenance world, making it easy to consume and deploy highly effective policies that ultimately ensure the organization and the environment is secured, whether that's, you know, the remote user space on into branch to campus and into ultimately the data center in the long run, right? So are you saying that MIST would do the initial configuration of my firewall or my SD-WAN device as I'm setting it up? It would. It would be able to do zero touch provisioning, you know, so you don't even have to have a truck roll and have your talent out at the site. As long as, you know, somebody can find the power cord, plug it in, rack it up, then, uh, you know, snap a picture. Heck, even I can do that. <laughs> JJ, I think you give yourself uh, too little credit. I've seen your talents, but uh, indeed, that's the vision is to make it as easy as possible to repeatedly bring online these incredible security capabilities to deliver on the efficacy that we've demonstrated we're incredibly well known for, but to do so without, you know, having this incredible onerous tax or experience when these devices are brought up. Hang on. I'm going to table SRX and SSR. We'll talk about what that is, but those are what I think of is wide area networking, you know, remote site. But you said remote user. Are you guys doing ZTNA type of stuff as well? SASE, SSE? So we do have SSE, right? So Secure Service Edge solution today, Juniper Secure Edge. But also we have a few different remote user capabilities. And more importantly, stepping back, I think before I get into the products and the solutions, talk to the issue and the problem that I hear from customers most often. And that's what they're looking for is kind of a ubiquitous or universal solution for ensuring that the same security and network experiences, right, the same policies are applied to a user, whether they're at home, right, as I'm connecting here, talking with you both today, or they're at a branch location or, or traveling into the campus or the headquarters, right? Today, there are portions of these solutions delivered via SAS or SSC, but it breaks down when you actually have that person transition into the large environment because obviously the network policies don't follow the users for your average SASE offering, right? Secure access service edge. So our vision is indeed that this concept of, I think, become known as universal ZTNA or UZTNA is emerging as an approach to address and to solve for this. And so ultimately, we see that that's what customers are demanding. And two things we already have. We have remote access. We also have very incredible NAC or network access control solution that is cloud managed and snaps right into the NIST portal. It was announced about a year ago all falling under the umbrella of where we're heading as an organization to address these needs. And so I think, you know, without getting into too much detail, partly it's just ensuring that customers hear and or recognize that there are approaches to solving for this. And because we have all of the controls that I've walked through today, right, both, you know, the security policy capability and the networking virtue of us already managing the switches, wireless, 
data center capabilities in MIST, bringing it all together in a single network and security policy experience is absolutely in plan. So that's, again, a bit of vision indeed where we see the market need clearly heading as well as, again, day in and day out. These are the conversations that customers are dying for asking me for support of and what they're looking for answers to. I'm intrigued by the universal aspect of the ZTNA because taking ZTNA ecosystem of products out, what we've had for a long time is this weird sprawl of what I'm going to network access, which is sometimes remote. So the experience and the agents and tools and the policies sometimes are different in an organization if it's, like you said, if the user's at home, if they're in their main office, if they're in a branch office, sometimes that looks different. If they're connected to a wired network with NAC, it might be different than what they need to do on a Wi-Fi network. And if they're accessing something on-prem, that might be a whole different tool set and access than if they're accessing, you know, something in the cloud, like IaaS or PaaS in the, in the cloud. And they end up with all of these agents and there's all of these different weird policies and different identities tied to that. So it sounds like the universal ZTNA is bringing that all under one umbrella. That is indeed the case, because there isn't an answer that I could point to from any vendor in the world right now that does this. And again, having had dozens of conversations in the last few months on this very topic, the reality is what's sorely needed uh, and ensuring that it doesn't just stop at the edge, right? You know, again, SASE is awesome in respect to addressing the needs of that kind of former branch rack issue, right? Multi-appliance plus the remote users. It brought things from that chaotic edge or outside into the perimeter, but it didn't step inside. And that's what Universal ZTNA is going to do, is to make sure that it's all one kind of comprehensive offer. So to my mind, ZTNA is about a few things. It's about policy. It's about identity. It's about having the enforcement points in place and then continuous assessment. And you know, if you're going to offer that, you either have to have all the components in your own portfolio or to integrate with third-party systems. Is Juniper delivering all these elements now? Is Juniper planning to integrate? What is your vision for pulling all those pieces together? Well, I can't speak to some other business activities and things coming, but uh, indeed there's, I think, a path and a plan as well as a recognition that this is what customers are demanding. Plus, we do have remote access today via VPN clients as well as the NAC capabilities for the on-premises already, both of which are cloud managed. And over time, right, this is clearly an area that we're incredibly well positioned to address via one kind of comprehensive policy control set, both security and networking side. So I'll just say that without spoiling anything of what's coming, Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> I guess that's fair. <laughs> I'm really interested in the whole cloud NAC because those of us that have worked in the Microsoft ecosystem, and I know that's not everybody, but there's a lot of us here, you know, we didn't have anything, even when Microsoft did all of the M365, intra ID, whatever they want to call their stuff today. Like the only way to do any type of authentication really was to outside of the SaaS ecosystem for Microsoft to spin up an entire Azure server and run a cloud server environment as infrastructure, managed separately, paid separately. Oh, and by the way, you can't use it with the same domain you're using for your M365 and intra ID. And the whole like logic chain of trying to do that just got really complicated. And so there were some pocket solutions around this third party thing and that third party thing. And they integrated a little bit with Microsoft. We won't dive into it today, but I think our listeners might be interested to understand what the cloud NAC solution is, because that's a separate thing than what we're talking about today. But it's interesting that it kind of plays into this whole ecosystem and that potentially in an environment that's got, you know, missed infrastructure, you would have access to all of that in one place, SD-WAN, remote routing, wired, wireless, et cetera. Yeah, now the Juniper Access Assurance capability is specifically our cloud-based NAC offer. The Access Assurance, okay. Exactly. And for customers looking to take a look, anybody out there who wants to dig in, I'd encourage you to do so. It is very unique, as I've also been around NAC for a very long time, right? TCG, TNG days. Mm -hmm. uh, That's probably met you in passing back in the day. It might have been indeed, JJ. I was uh, actually at uh, HP at the time, 03, 02, 04. It goes back a long ways, but uh, you know, we're still, I mean, largely it had been a, an uninvolved space for a very long time. So I think, you know, the way in which it was solved for and ultimately is delivered now with the access assurance offering is a very operationally and Mac and simple are often not words that you'd put in the same sentence, but it is a graceful capability that does provide a fairly simple and effective way to uh, integrate in as few points as possible. And for like all Microsoft shops, yes, a single. Plus, it's not an onus on you to deploy those on-premises capabilities for the NAC control because by being cloud-based, that solves a really big challenge for anyone that's ever gone down the supplicant deployment and commit route, which, you know, probably share scars and speak to how much fun, you know, some of those experiences used to be. 
Uh, all I'll say is that uh, Access Assurance solves this in a different way than anyone's ever seen Mac done before. And I'd encourage them to investigate because it's cool. My therapist says I shouldn't talk about it yet. <laughs> I did want to come back around. You know, I kind of punted SRX and SSR more on the routing side because I was curious what you were doing on the remote user as opposed to remote site. You know, I think probably a lot of the listeners are familiar with SRX's firewalls and Mike, you know, full disclosure, we do kind of poke at the SRXs a little bit here. I think those of us that were early adopters got the short stick with that back in the day, but that's been a long time ago. So what, from the standpoint of the SRX and the SSR today, as it writes this zero trust architecture and these new capabilities, what are we looking at? What are the features and what is that? Yeah, I mean, the SRX engine in particular, right, is that efficacy that we've been demonstrating in third-party tests for many years, right, via the physical appliances, but also the SSR, the secure session router, right, is the tunnelless SD-WAN innovation or capability that we have available for customers. Did you just say tunnelless? SD WAN. He did. And if you want to see a really nerdy tech field day about that, go look up. There's some old tech field day videos about 128 technology prior to the acquisition where we went oh. really long and deep on tunnel versus tunnel. It's interesting. I'm going to go look. Okay. So give us a nickel tour though. So the nickel tour. So the secure session router is quite simply a SD WAN or a branch connectivity device that doesn't depend on the traditional approach of building tunnels between two locations. And then furthermore, passing, you know, encrypted traffic within. So in most environments, you know, HPS, for example, is encrypted by default. And that over a tunnel is going to increase the overhead by 20 to 45 percent, depending on a variety of factors. The tunnelless proposal is that you know, the SSR is able to establish an incredibly secure point-to-point -point link without the dependency on that additional encryption. And so thus you save 20 to 45 percent of that bandwidth between two links. And now there's a whole host of additional technical details that get into the merit and the possibilities that are unlocked with that because it is prescriptive, explicit, link-to-link, app-by-app basis control, which in very secure environments is incredibly powerful. But the SSR is that manifestation of that format, right? And ultimately, the offer is incredibly cool for you know customers that double-click in. And as you mentioned, right, Drew, the, the earlier tech deep dive that you've done in the past does go into great detail. And, and it's a part of the MIST environment that we talked about, added under the umbrella, of course, after the acquisition. About two years ago is when it, we made the acquisition now. I guess it's been about three years or so. Yeah. So that's SSR. I have to ask, though, with the SSR. I mean, I've heard it, but I've never deployed it. So... If you have several sites and you're connecting them, you would not have to follow the typical staging of migrating and having both people at both sides and rekeying and spinning things up in a weird inner tunnels, outer tunnels and meshes and this and that. And then that broke. And now these three sites are down, except for this one's doing it unidirectional. And that's weird. Does it eliminate that type of original configuration? It does. Similar to the description I gave you a moment ago about how to bring an SRX online with this new proposal, there is a zero touch provisioning. There's a simple code on the back of the box, you know, you to easily connect and to adhere or to basically inherit the network policies that automatically will bring it online, right? You don't have to roll a tech or an expert out to the site. It's all managed via MIST, and it's actually a pretty graceful process. I think there's some videos, in fact, maybe Drew, I'll provide a link after for you to provide for your listeners, but like three minutes, you could get a sense for both the 20 seconds it takes to bring on appliance online, and then just walking through the screens as to how simple it really is. It's cool. And you know the geek in me definitely gets excited about technology being made this easy for customers to deploy. Yeah, I think site tunnels. And I mean, really, honestly, I hit a point where I did tech stuff long enough that I got a little tired and lazy. And I was happy to do firewall deployments until it got to the point where we had to do all of these crazy, you know, remote site connections. And some of them were on fiber and MPLS and others are on these weird just over public internet. And it just got so freaking complicated to architect it and maintain it. It's like it's too often that something quirky happens and then things go down and stuff's not going properly, which was one of the reasons I personally, you know, the team did SD-WAN and does SD-WAN stuff, but I would just kind of noped out of that because it just seemed overwhelming with everything else that we were dealing with. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's just, of course, in the physical device or appliance realm, right? When you include or, or you start to you know bring up multi-cloud providers and the key management schemas, how much Advil do you have? I mean, it's its own world. And frankly, you probably got a staff dedicated to the joys of, of dealing with all of the tunnel work and you know, zoning and so forth. So it's more than a handful. I don't think I needed Advil. I think it would have been, what was that mommy's little helper? Oh, <laughs> Xanax. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> That's where I was with it. 
<laughs> uh, yes, so that's what we've aspired to solve for is to make this as easy as possible because yeah, again, we've always said, right, in this world, right, both networking and security, you know, the most incredible technology is that which is invisible, right? Users should never feel or, you know, be impacted by anything that's under the water. It should just be this ubiquitously perfect experience, which is all well and good when it's all working perfectly. But it's a lot of heroics on the backs of incredible operational professionals historically to achieve this. And that's, I think, what the MIST AI and this really aggressive and dedicated innovation around, you know, really simplifying the onboarding of appliances, the visibility to network and security telemetry, providing those tools, that information, that data to the men and women that need it at the time they need it, and ultimately ensuring that their organization's not just up, but also incredibly well protected and that they're able to collaborate and work together as one team, as one organization to deliver on that outcome. So last question then, can you kind of wrap all this up in a bow for us around zero trust architecture and, and what it means in regards to Juniper's portfolio? Sure, Drew. That's certainly a term that I think most organizations have heard and are pursuing likely plans to adopt if they've not already, you know, well along the integration for it. So fundamentally, right, zero trust is you know, the prospect of always verifying, right, never trusting and ensuring that the network and security policies follow the user from their remote experience on through into the environment and ensuring they have access to the resources and the data as well as the tools they need to do their jobs effectively and not access to the things that they don't need or that they shouldn't have access. And that includes, you know, again, compromised browsers or, you know, hijacking where they may not actually be the user, even if it's their credentials being employed by an actor, you know, accessing the environment. So all these things are in motion and supported and ultimately, everything I've discussed, right, with respect to secure AI native edge, the security assurance offering, security insight, and our security efficacy delivers on this for organizations today. And then that's exactly what we're aspiring to deliver for. Mike, if folks are looking to get more information about any of the things we talked about today, which was a lot, what would you recommend they do? I'd encourage folks to come to juniper.net and to navigate to the security site. And you, from that umbrella, you'll find links to all of what we've discussed here today, allowing you to double click into any of these technologies or to learn more about how you can achieve the same kind of outcome that we've discussed. So that's juniper.net. We'll also have show links in the show notes that accompany this episode. Mike, thank you for joining us. And thanks to Juniper for being a sponsor of the Packet Protector. And thank you for listening. If you've got a topic you want us to cover, you can find us on LinkedIn or at packetpushers.net slash community, where you can join our free Slack channel with other IT and security pros. Got a comment, correction, or question? Reach out to us at pushers.net slash FU. The FU is for follow-up, and we appreciate when listeners reach out. Make sure you eat your security vegetables. 